All right. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. Welcome to another fantastic talk of the Dr. GPCR Summit. Today, we have with us Dr. Aaron Sato, CSO of Twist Biopharma, Division of Twist Bioscience. Before we start, I'd like to thank Aaron, you for being here, as well as our partners, Domain Therapeutics, Twist Biopharma, GPCR Therapeutics, Montana Molecular, and Synapse. So today, Aaron is going to talk to us about synthetic DNA technologies that enable fast and responsive anti-GPCR antibody discovery and optimization. Before we let Aaron take on the spot and talk to us about this, uh, talk to us and give us his presentation, uh, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you. Please make sure that your microphone is off during the talk. Uh, please make sure that your Zoom and your Microsoft Teams has your name fully written out as well as a profile picture so that people can recognize you. Uh, at the end of uh, Aaron's talk, we'll have about a 15-minute live Q&A session. If you don't have a chance to ask your question, please go on Teams where you'll be able to not only interact with Aaron, but also with Twist Biopharma. Please make sure that uh, on Teams, as well as I mentioned, you have your full name and your picture so that people can recognize you. And on Teams, uh, I have to also mention that you'll be able to meet all our partners. And with this, let's hear it from Aaron. Thanks, Yamina. Uh, again, my name is Aaron Sato. I'm the CSO of Twist Bioscience. Uh, and my other hat is I also oversee the Twist Biopharma team, which is an amazing team that uses all of Twist's amazing DNA products for antibody discovery and antibody optimization. When we got into this business, um, we really focused on difficult to drug targets, and you'll hear a story today about how we um, use our DNA technologies to uh, address a really tough to drug GPCR target um, called Adora 2A. I always say the best companies out there really understand the one thing they're really good at. And for Twist, that's our ability to print DNA on silicon. So on this uh, amazing silicon chip in the middle of the slide, we can actually print up to a million individual algos up to 300 base pairs in length. So it's an amazing system for making discrete pools of individual algos. And we can use those algo pools to then elude off the surface of the silicon chip and make all kinds of custom DNA products. So we make um, custom clonal genes up to 5KB, clone in any vector you wish. We can use, um, we use algo pools to do custom NGS enrichment ahead of NGS sequencing. But another fantastic application of using algo pools is also the ability to make high quality, very diverse uh, DNA libraries. And that's actually key and central to the Twist Biopharma vertical, which uses um, our library platform to create our own fully human synthetic um, antibody phage display libraries, which we call our library of libraries. So why is um, using alga pools in my mind so game changing um, compared to kind of how people have made um, DNA libraries in the past? So in, in the past, people typically would use a degenerate alga to encode for diversity in a DNA library. And so they would either use mixtures of nucleotides or mixtures of trinucleotides to create um, algos that would vary specific amino acids um, within, say, uh, an encoded protein. Here, we're actually using alga pools of discrete sequences that we synthesize in a pool. And so I know that sounds kind of subtle, a subtle difference between a degenerate algo and an alga pool, but it actually gives us a lot tighter control over what the diversity goes into our, the specific DNA libraries that we're creating. And in the case of building antibody libraries, um, I find it gives us a lot of really nice control as to the position by position, um, uh, what you allow in your particular um, antibody library, as well as the advantage I love to cite is it's fairly easy to, to adjust the lengths of in particular CDRs as you build an antibody library. And you'll see in a second how we build antibody libraries, but this slide's a really nice one to kind of show how um, all the various advantages of using alga pools over degenerate algos. And again, I, the, the advantage I love to cite is the CDR length variation, particularly in heavy chain CDR3. So how do we use alga pools to build an antibody library? So if you think about an antibody domain, let's say a heavy chain, it's basically a series of loops or CDR loops within a specific human germline framework. We can basically make an alga pool that encodes for diversity in each of those different loops and then just piece them together within that single human germline framework using PCR. And so that allows us to, as we uh, synthesize those CDR alga pools, to actually synthesize natural human sequence as we build a library. 
So rather than using like mixtures of amino acids that, you know, kind of mimic what's seen in nature here, we, act, we can actually take real sequences derived from NGS uh, databases of human antibody sequences and use it as an input to synthesize the oligos that go into the oligo pools that then are used to build um, all of the libraries that we've created. Another cool advantage I love to cite about using alga pools to build libraries is that we can also take away sequences. So even though I think sequences that come out of humans are amazing and they're the, the, the best sequences to use for building libraries, there are a couple sequences in there that you might want to remove just because they might have some developability or instability. And we know a lot of rules in terms of the dipeptide sequences that you might want to avoid. We can actually remove those from the design as we build a library. And then finally, if we choose to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, but it's actually key and central to some of our target class specific libraries. We can actually incorporate uh, motifs into our, our libraries as well. And that's actually been key and central to a lot of our GPCR and ion channel and um, carbohydrate libraries that I'll talk about in a bit. So as I, as I mentioned, Twist Biopharma, we're a division of Twist Bioscience, which is the large, the, the parent company that we sit inside of. Um, and again, we, we, ha we, we have the, all these amazing advantages, which I'll talk about in a second, but the one that's really key and central to our success is that we can, again, um, use all the tools of antibody, or all the DNA tools of Twist to basically help enable us to discover antibodies. So we'll have our, um, our library of libraries, which we'll talk about in a second, which is uh, over 17 different fully human antibody phages, but libraries all made with that library platform I talked about before. And then we also have a whole um, uh, technology for antibody optimization that we call TAU, which stands for Twist Antibody Optimization. And as you'll see later, um, it actually rests again on our ability to make high quality, highly diverse DNA libraries using all the pools, as well as some software that we've created. Again, Twist uh, Biopharma, we really sit at the front end of the uh, antibody discovery and optimization workflow. We don't really do anything in the target validation space to help um, others discover specific targets. And we don't really do a lot of work on the back end to help kind of uh, do, for example, in vivo studies or toxicology studies. Um, and it's our vision someday to actually um, cover this whole uh, workflow from initial target ID all the way through development. But for, for now, we actually really just focus on the front end of the workflow. So in terms of our overall strategic areas, um, as I mentioned, we're very focused on uh, building libraries derived from natural human sequences. We've also, again, put those into various scaffolds. So we have fab-based libraries, single-chain FV libraries, and VHH libraries that we can then reformat again into either full IgGs or VHHFCs. Um, the example I'll talk about today is actually a project we did where we um, actually immunized some mice um, with, in this case, uh, Adora2a, which is a... GPCR target, and we actually used the, those sequences that came out of the mouse to actually um, create a highly diverse antibody phage display library that we then pan and screen and came up with a whole bunch of functional hits against the Dora2a. So that's an example where we didn't just create a pre-made library that was naive, we actually used real sequence information derived from the um, actual immunization um, of a Dora2a. Um, second, we also have a lot of, we've done a lot of work on creating target class specific libraries. We actually have um, several different GBCR libraries. Um, I won't talk about those today, but we actually have some several naive libraries that we can also use against um, difficult to drug GPCR targets to help enable um, discovery of um, either antagonists or agonists against different GPCR targets. As I mentioned, we have a platform for antibody optimization, which I'll talk about later called Tau. And then finally, um, because Twist is an amazing company that can make huge numbers of clonal DNA sequences, um, uh, cloned into any plasma you wish. We've also created a whole workflow for high throughput antibody production as well, where we can actually uh, make the clonal genes, transfect them into um, HEC293 cells and actually make large numbers, but small amounts of antibody for your screening purposes. So I'm often asked, Aaron, like what makes you different than a lot of your competitors? Because there's a lot of you know, competitors in this antibody discovery and optimization space. Well, the first one is that we're, we're, we're probably the only um, antibody discovery and optimization group that actually sits instead of a large uh, DNA company. And that gives us a huge um, advantage in terms of our ability to access a broad DNA buffet to create highly diverse um, antibody phage display libraries. You know, making a library typically in the past has been very difficult. And so a lot of our competitors may just have a few libraries because they're just so difficult to put together using degenerate 
um, oligos. But again, here, because we have this amazing ability to bring together DNA using oligo pools, we've now created over 17 different um, fully human antibody libraries in phage display. The second advantage is really uh, goes back to my advantage of using oligo pools of degenerate oligos. Um, every single sequence that goes into our libraries is explicitly synthesized. So all the CDRs that go into our Li our antibody libraries are all derived from natural human sequence. And so and nothing's random. And so everything, any, every antibody that comes out of our libraries um, looks just like an antibody that would come out of a person. And then finally, um, uh, it kind of rests on our ability to synthesize DNA on silicon. We have this amazing ability to miniaturize and automate all the processes of um, making DNA. And we've actually applied a lot of that learning to um, automating and miniaturizing the whole antibody discovery workflow as well. So as I mentioned, um, we're really driving towards having what I call a library of libraries. Um, it's my vision someday to actually have uh, actually a whole plate of a hundred different libraries because in phage display, we're oftentimes limited to a diversity of around 10 billion different antibodies in a library. One way to address that and to go beyond that is actually to have more libraries. And so if we have a hundred libraries of 10 to the 10th, we have over 10 to 12 different total antibodies at, at our disposal to find and pull out our highly functional and specific leads to any target we wish. So that will, um, and really Twist is one of the few companies that could ever do that because again, we have this amazing ability to print DNA so fast and so quickly um, and with such high quality. So this slide is a overview of all the libraries we have in our library libraries. I'll go through it at a high level uh, for this talk. Um, and then I'll dive into the case study that I told you about before, which is we used a, an immune repertoire from an Adora 2A immunized mouse to actually discover um, antibodies to Adora 2A. So on the far left, we have our fully human fab library. It's a very diverse fully human antibody fab library where we've actually made a very large oligo pool that encodes for over two and a half million heavy chain CDR3 sequences and actually put that into the library. It's a, it's a workhorse library for us. We can find antibodies to all kinds of different targets. Um, we've also made not only a fab version of this library, we've also made a single chain FE library as well as a common light chain version of the same library. The second type of library that we have is our, um, our VHH single domain libraries. Again, these are also workhorse libraries for us. Um, again, unlike the heavy chain light chain based libraries here, we're just using a single VHH um, in our library. We've actually uh, used a database of over 3000 LAMA CD, uh, VHHs as an input to create this library. Um, and we created multiple different forms, um, different types of designs based on that data. And we've actually created five different um, VHH libraries, one of which is actually a GPCR focused VHH library as well. The next four are our SCFE libraries. The first one is what we call our structural SCFE library. It's a library where we actually took all known um, human antibodies that have ever been crystallized and used that as an input data set to create the structural antibody library. The second is what we call our ancestral library, which is we actually took all human antibodies that are in the patent database um, for a specific germline VH3 family and actually use that as an input to create a fully human antibody library. The third is what we call our Minotaur library. It's a fully human antibody library, but in the heavy chain CDR3 register, we actually use um, long bovine heavy chain CDR3s um, as the part as the input for the design. So these weren't the ultra long ones that have the non structure, just the really long ones. And so that allows us to potentially get into epitopes, for example, on GPCRs that may enable us to uh, unlock um, specific targets. And then finally, our last one is a library that we created in collaboration with uh, Deep CDR, which we call our AI hypermutated SCFE library. Um, it's a library where, that we actually work with them where they, they gave us and simulated over a million different sequences derived from NGS data um, of, of uh, human sequences, human databases. And we then use those millions of sequences to actually design this AI hypermutated library that's basically uh, uh, built off of these uh, simulated fully human antibody sequences. And then finally, the last three libraries are all focused on difficult to drug targets. We have a whole series of libraries focused on GPCRs that either use motifs that bind to GPCRs as uh, part of their design. We have an ion channel library that also uses a similar idea where we actually take uh, motifs derived from things that bind to ion channels and actually incorporate that into the heavy chain CDR3 of the library. And then finally, we've also uh, created a library against um, carbohydrate antigens using uh, known sequences that are known to bind to carbohydrates. So those are all the libraries. As I mentioned, we have a lot of plot to choose from. 
So if anybody comes to us with a, a difficult to drug target, we oftentimes will use uh, mixtures and multiple libraries all at once to make sure that we're successful against their particular target. So how do we go about using the library libraries? So again, we take, um, oftentimes we'll take pools of libraries and we oftentimes pool libraries based on scaffolds. So we might have a fab pool, SCFE phage pool, and maybe a VHH phage pool. We'll then pan and screen that against the target. In this case with a GPCR target, we'll be now um, for this particular case study of, we'll have again, an immunized an animal with a 2A that we did actually through DNA-based immunization. We use those sequences to design a library and put that into phage display. And then we then um, put it through the workflow that I'll walk you through on this slide. So the first um, step is we did panning and screening with that library. We did that on cells that um, uh, overexpress the GPCR target Adora2A. In this case, we also had recombinant uh, protein that, uh, for Adora2A. And so we used a combination of cells and protein to pan and screen um, against this uh, difficult to drug target. And in, in retrospect, um, a lot of the successes we've had with um, GPCRs have really rested on having some form of recombinant protein for the GPCR target. Overexpressed cells often do work, but having recombinant protein is also a major advantage for this project. After we got our hits from our phage panning, we then sequenced um, the entire repertoire of sequences that came out of the panning and did uh, clonal Sanger sequencing, pulled out of all of our hits um, to this particular screen. We then reformatted all of them to full IgG, scaled up those DNAs, and then ported it through the high throughput IgG purification process that I'll show you in a second, and then ran those uh, IgGs through a whole series of binding and functional assays. Just a real high level, high level overview of our high throughput antibody production workflow. So again, Twist is an amazing company for making clonal genes, so that was easy for us. Uh, the next part of the workflow is we basically um, created a whole workflow for doing transient transfection in XP293 cells from Thermo where we can either do a one mil or eight mil transient transfection to give us either about hundred micrograms, upwards of a milligram of antibody. And again, we can do that in a very short period of time to deliver back um, purified antibody to our partners. But again, for this particular project, we use that as part of the overall discovery workflow to make you know, upwards of a hundred different antibodies to Adora 2A and see how well they bound and whether they had function against this particular GPCR target. So now getting on to Adora2A and the case study I'll talk about today. So again, as we all know, uh, the checkpoint market is rapidly growing. Um, but again, there's still you know, sufficient unmet medical need in the sense that you know, not all patients actually respond to amino oncology, amino uh, checkpoint therapy. And one unmet, one large opportunity is that we know that um, a lot of checkpoint inhibitors can actually be um, uh, have a lot of synergy with one another. So if we can have, for example, have an Adora2A receptor inhibitor um, combined with say an anti-PD-1 therapy, we might be able to gain access to more patients and have greater um, efficacy in the clinic. So Adora2A, it's a master checkpoint, the tumor microenvironment is highly expressed in a number of different cancers. And it's been shown through a lot of small molecule work that, um, that it's, it's a validated target to go after in the immune oncology space. But an antibody um, would have a lot of advantages over a lot of these small molecules that are currently in the clinic. And there's actually no known um, uh, Adora 2A antibody antagonist that's either, at least in my knowledge, in preclinical or even in the, in the clinic today. So this is an amazing feat that we're actually able to find not only an antibody binder to Adora 2A, but also a functional antagonist. So um, those of you that are familiar with this target know that, uh, again, adenosine is uh, again released by the tumor and has an immunosuppressive effect on the tumor microenvironment. Um, and there's again, multiple steps in the progression of ATP to adenosine. There are other um, enzymes and receptors that are involved in the progression of ATP to adenosine. And the last step in this immunosuppressive um, uh, uh, activation event is actually the binding of adenosine to um, adenosine uh, receptors on T cells. And Adora2A is actually, again, one of the key drivers in this immunosuppressive signal. So if we can actually, for example, find an antibody that binds Adora2A and blocks the action of adenosine, we might be able to relieve the breaks uh, on this immunosuppressive signal and allow the, your immune system to actually uh, uh, eradicate your tumor. And in addition, there are other closely related family members um, in the adenosine receptor family um, we really want to focus on Adora 2A. So there's some literature showing that Adora 2B may also be 
um, play a role. And some of the small molecules that are in the clinic currently actually hit both a door 2A and a door 2B. We want to make sure that our antibody is at least specific for a door 2A. And maybe we're interested in having some activity against a door 2B, but we want to make sure we don't have hit any have any activity against some of the other adenosine receptors that may be more important for normal physiology. So now I'll jump into um, our screening workflow, um, kind of a workhorse instrument for us in the testing of our antibodies for binding to cells is our IQ, our IQ3 uh, flow cytometer. It's really important for us because we typically make you know, upwards of 100 antibodies to, in our campaigns. And so we need to have a way to rapidly screen our antibodies for binding to, uh, in this case, GPCRs overexpressed on cells. Um, it allows us to really, really quickly to, um, you know, look at, um, we have a time to do some controls up front. In this case, we actually had a, a cell line, I mean, a transiently transfected line where we actually, um, it was GFP tags. So we're actually able to see the overall expression of a door 2A um, using this GFP tag construct. And really we were able to focus in on that population of cells. Um, we then looked at a, some of several control antibodies and saw that we were able to see again, good you know, highly, you know, high affinity binding for this RD control antibody. And again, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll look at both GFP negative and GFP positive cells to really show the, the specific binding to GFP positive, uh, in this case, DORA 2A transfected cells and low binding to uh, non transfected cells. We then um, will do an initial screen. So we'll typically take all of our hits. So you can see here, we had a whole plate of antibodies uh, potentially that bound to a door 2A. And we then did a, a screen where we looked at a, the binding of all of these antibodies at once at concentration, which again, in this case was about hundred nanomolar. And what we found is we found several antibodies as you'll see in a second that had um, comparable binding to the RNG antibody um, and others that had weaker binding, but we use this again as initial screen to basically give us all of our winners to follow up on to do uh, further titrations. And so this is another way to look at the data. Again, it's looking at um, the binding of our antibodies to um, the GFP transfected cells versus the non-transfected cells. And so you can definitely see that we have a number of antibodies that show nice um, binding to the GFP positive transfected cells over the negative cells. It's another way to look at it, again, showing the um, uh, how we can look in a view with both GFP positive and negative cells. And you can see that Again, the, the winners that we see have a you know, really nice um, binding to the GFP positive transfected cells. It's another way for the, another readout from the instrument, which we really like. Again, you can look at the singlet individual cells that are GFP positive versus GFP negative. And again, this is a nice way to look, for example, like th these antibodies would show a really high um, uh, fluorescence intensity. You can go back down below and look at the GFP negative cells and see that we see low levels of binding. So it's a nice another way to gauge the level of specific binding of an antibody to its specific target. And then finally, we'll then follow up with um, specific titrations for all those that bound with um, in the initial screen. And so you can see that in the titration now of all the winners that I showed before, you can see again, nice um, high affinity binding with EC50s is in the range of you know, one to double digit nanomolar for binding to the ADORA 2A transfected cells that's comparable to the control antibody. And again, this is just, again, going back to that same view of looking at GFP positive versus negative cells. And again, you can see nice um, whole populations of cells that are plotted. And we see nice fluorescence intensity for the titration compared to the background uh, non-transfected cells. So after all of that work, we actually came up with multiple candidates. I'm just showing you one of those candidates where we showed that um, the antibody had um, high affinity binding to GFP, GFP positive DORA 2A transfected cells. In a cyclic AMP assay, this antibody actually had um, very potent, uh, was a functional antagonist of the receptor. We actually went back and did further work to show that it wasn't actually a direct um, uh, isosteric antagonist in the sense that it didn't um, uh, actually directly block adenosine binding and was actually an allosteric inhibitor uh, of the receptor. This antibody also shows very specific binding to ADORA 2A. Um, it also has some cross reactivity to the mouse receptor and shows low level of binding to the other family members in the adenosine family. We then also did a primary T cell assay where we again um, took, took PBMCs and, uh, and actually stimulated them um, with. Uh, 
with uh, adenosine, with an, a, an agonist NECA adenosine uh, molecule, and then look to see whether we could, um, oh, sorry, we look to see whether we could then um, uh, relieve that immunosuppression due to the agonist adenosine that we added. And we looked at um, the relief of that uh, immunosuppressive signal by looking at interferon gamma that's released by the activated T cells. And what we found is that we many of our antibodies, in particular that antibody I just talked about, TB206-001, um, showed an increase in interferon gamma associated with increased concentration of the antibody that was actually very comparable to a small molecule antagonist of Vitora 2 a So again, we were able to find antibodies that showed um, comparable levels of um, activation in primary T cells that was comparable to a known intact small molecule antagonist of Adora 2A. We've now gone on and done some initial um, in vivo studies, so just showing one of them, where we actually um, dosed um, one of these antibodies, TB206-007, um, as well as 001, where we see you know, really nice um, uh, inhibition of tumor growth relative to isotype control. And in, a bit, in, in particular, for one of the antibodies, we actually saw better activity relative to anti-PD-1 therapy in this uh, humanized tumor model. So again, gives us some initial data. We've actually now gone on and done a more thorough study with multiple antibodies and actually have multiple candidates that show um, uh, very nice activity in humanized uh, tumor models. And we've done a lot of uh, cell profiling in these models as well. We find that in many cases uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, tumor regression may be caused by an increase in uh, macrophages that are infiltrating the tumors. Again, we need to do some more thorough analysis um, of the cellular compartment within these models, but this gives us some hints as to how we're seeing this uh, relief of this immunosuppressive effect that's caused by um, dosing with our anti adora 2 antibody. Okay, now I'll just end with our, our Tau platform, which is an amazing uh, platform for doing antibody optimization. We can actually now take any antibody we wish derived from any sequence, uh, whether it's derived from mice all the way to fully human antibodies, say, for example, derived from our own libraries. We can actually imp input that into our custom software, which basically um, takes looks at your sequence and looks for um, CDR sequences that are similar with a defined mutational distance that you can set. That you set. So, for example, um, if I give it a distance of three, it will actually look at my CDR sequences and give me all fully human CDR sequences that are within three amino acids in every position of my um, fully of my antibody. I can then use that data to actually design an optimization library around your my specific lead. If the original antibody input antibody is actually a mouse antibody, I can also humanize the antibody as I build the library and also replace all of the mouse CRs with human equivalents. This is actually a great way to do humanization because the final antibody looks just like any fully human antibody that would come out of a person. And so this kind of, again, breaks down the overall strategy for how we use Tau. So again, we input the antibody into the software. It gets a whole series of algo pools to make for each different CDR loop. We order those algos and then use it to build the library. And then we can, in a very short period of time, um, uh, take initial candidate and optimize it for increased affinity in this case. So showing here just one example where we took a PD-1 antibody that had a 325 nanomolar monovalent affinity and actually increased it down to single digit nanomolar. And as a, uh, in addition, you know, we've done a lot of work um, kind of validating our libraries against multiple targets. So we've done a lot of work on GPCR as I, as I just showed. Um, and we're continuing to work on some internal targets as well to help further validate our libraries, as well as to potentially create some leads that we want to go out and uh, partner and license to others. Shown here is just an example of a pipeline of preclinical ready uh, monoclonal antibodies that we have already ready to go. I already talked about Adora 2A, um, which again is available for licensing, but we have other immuno oncology targets, as well as other GPCR targets like CXCR4 and GLP1R that we actually have antagonists for. And then like a lot of others, we've also done a lot of work on COVID as well. So just to conclude, um, ways you can work with Twist Biopharma, we're very open to licensing libraries so it's through a subscription-based model where you pay a low um, yearly license fee and you get access to all the libraries in the library of libraries, which is an amazing value for you to do the work in your own lab. If you don't have that capacity to do that work in your lab, we can also do partnership around helping you discover antibodies using our own services here at, um, at Twist. You can also do um, work to help you optimize your antibodies using the Tau platform that I talked about. We, of course, are very open to collaborating around select 
leads, for example, leads like the ones I showed on in the lead licensing slide a couple of slides ago. A lot of customers we work with actually also um, will build their, their own libraries with our custom library team, but won't actually have the ability to screen it because they won't have lab capacity potentially. Um, oftentimes we can actually work with the library team and the biopharma team can actually help out with the screening, particularly if it's done in phage display. And then finally, as I mentioned, the biopharma team actually created the high throughput IgG product and we're now rolling that out to select customers in an alpha setting. So if you're interested in high throughput antibody production, please follow up with us. That's the end of my talk. Really enjoyed um, the opportunity to talk to you today about Twist's amazing platform and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, now is the time to type your questions in the chat or um, turn on your mic and camera and feel free to to ask Aaron questions. While people are typing their questions in the chat, I had uh, two short questions. Sure. I loved uh, showing that, I loved seeing that the data where you've shown that the, the, gen, the generated antibody has, uh, an, sorry, it's the end of the day, um, has a great effect on decreasing the size of the tumor compared to the PDL antibody. Have you ever tested combining both of those antibodies together? Uh, we have, yeah. So, um, uh, we're just getting to that now. We did see some modest effect through combination. I, we mm -hmm. we want to look at that further. Um, I think the ultimate therapeutic could also be a bispecific where we might um, you know, combine our PD-1 arm with an Adora 2A arm, which I think would have a kind of a nice kind of one-two punch <laughs> against the tumor. Fantastic, which actually leads me to my next question. Uh, speaking of bispecific antibodies, how easy or how hard would it be to uh, generate antibodies that specifically recognize a pair of GPCRs? I'm thinking two different GPCRs that interact together. Yeah, that would be pretty uh, straightforward to do. Again, we would just undertake um, different antibody campaigns against both targets, and then we would take um, leads from each of them and basically pair them together in a bispecific. We've, we have a lot of experience working with uh, multiple uh, formats. Um, I think it's also nice to use a lot of the VHHs as part of that, those bispecifics. So uh, a lot of times we can find GPCRs really readily, uh, it leads really readily from our VHH libraries against GPCRs. And so that makes them very modular to combine together to create bispecifics to multiple targets. Fantastic. So we have a question in the chat. Taylor, Taylor says, for the nanobody libraries, do you have a sense of what fraction are properly folded and stable? Um, uh, all, what I do know is that we've been able to make our VHH nanobodies in both um, alone as well as infusion with FC. We get good expression and we see uh, nice stability. I haven't uh, determined the actual percent folded for each in each case, but um, I would assume that they're you know highly folded because they stay in solution. They're they they stay they're actually stable at really high concentrations. So I would assume that they're um, mostly folded in either case. Thank you, Taylor, for your question. Anyone else has any questions? Please break break the mold and turn on your camera and turn on your mic and ask questions. Once, twice, three times. Can I ask a question? Of sure. course, please. So, uh, you know, the antibody for GPCR, the specificity is a really, really huge problem, especially for small GPCRs. Most of the sequence are just lying in the transmembrane domain. So uh, for the adoral receptor, is that also most of the sequence are in the transmembrane domain? Uh, there's so a my question is related to how yeah. you check for the specificity of the receptor, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really important. Um, for this particular target, we did we checked for binding to all of the different family members. Um, we see that um, most of our antibodies are very specific for Adora 2A. We don't even see binding to Adora 2B, which is um, the, closely re the closest related family member. So we, we've checked for all of that just to make sure that we, we have the specificity. And that's really the hallmark of antibodies in general. You're right that... There's very little accessible surface and that could cause some lack of specificity, but in this case, we don't see that. Thank you, Tom. Like I, I work on the melanocortin receptors, um, MC3 and 4 receptor. You uh -huh. know, again, those are like a very small receptor, 330 amino acids. 
Uh-huh. And uh, there are even nature paper, you know, they just buy underbody and do wisdom blow out chain, a single band. Uh-huh. But that's the wrong result, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else has any questions? We still have time. We have 10 minutes to go, if need be. All right, once, twice. All right, stop me, someone. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron, right. for the presentation. Thank you, Mina. It was really fantastic. Uh, everyone can find you and uh, as well as the bio, Twist Biopharma team on, on Microsoft Teams through the entire week. Please yep. feel free to reach out to Aaron. And uh, thanks so much again for your time. Fantastic presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I want to thank again Aaron, Twist Biopharma, as well as our friends and partners at Domain Therapeutics. GBCO Therapeutics, Montana Molecular Synapse, and obviously Twist Biopharma for helping us put this fantastic summit together. Great, thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. Aaron, can you please hang back? Thanks, sure. everyone. I'll see you tomorrow, everybody. <laughs>